first lived in Latvia as a diplomat between 1996 and 1999, a few years after Latvia regained independence from the crumbling Soviet Union. I returned to live in Latvia in 2022. This podcast series is based on my observations and experience, with some history and comparisons with my home country of England on aspects of life in Latvia and things to see and experience. Episode 3 on castles and past invaders. At the weekend, I visited the Occupation Museum in Riga. Despite this being an essential location in the old town, I've never visited the museum before. Mostly because it is an imposing, elevated black box, an ugly building. The museum tells the story of the foreign occupation of Latvia over the last century, by Russians, but also by Germans. The opening exhibit says, This is a story about the Latvian nation and Latvian state that it founded in 1918, fought for and built on its ancestral land as the German and Russian empires collapsed at the end of the First World War. This is a story of the conspiracy between Communist Soviet Union and Nazi Germany and the three occupations that dismantled the Latvian state, defiled the land and, within half a century, brought the nation to the brink of extinction. This is a story about oppression, terror and violence, about defiance, resistance and heroism, but also about helplessness, fear and betrayal. Above all, however, this is a story of the stamina and spiritual strength that allowed the Latvian nation to renew the Latvian state and rejoin the world community of independent countries. Strong words. We will come back to the Occupation Museum, but first a quick history. The territory of the present-day Latvia has been settled on by Baltic people, hunter-gatherers, since about 9000 BC. Livonia, as it was known, became an important trading route. These tribes resisted Christianity. German crusaders were the first to occupy Livonia and established Riga as a strategic trading base in 1201. Riga became a principal city in the Hanseatic League of Cities around the Baltic Sea. Then in 1560, Russian forces under Ivan the Terrible conquered Livonia and installed a German as king of the Kingdom of Livonia from 1570 to 1578. Short-lived, as next came Polish-Lithuanian rulers, who established the Duchy of Livonia to re be replaced by invading Swedish forces in 1621. That lasted until 1710, when Russians invaded again under Peter the Great. The German nobility were allowed to keep their privileges, and the Latvian people were serfs to these feudal landowners until some emancipation was gained in the early 19th century. The Russian invaders introduced a programme of Russification in Livonia in 1889, forcing the use of Russian language in schools. During the 1905 Russian Revolution, Latvian peasants rose up against the German settlers and the Russian army. Over 2,000 Latvians were executed, 2,600 sent to gulags in Siberia, and 5,000 escaped to exile in Western Europe and North America. In 1915, Germany attacked and captured half of Latvia during the First World War. After Germany's defeat in 1917, Latvia declared autonomy as a country and independence was declared on the 17th of November 1918, a date still celebrated to this day. But a few days later, 
on the 1st of December 1918, Soviet Russia attacked and a war of independence ensued until a peace treaty was agreed with Russia in 1920. A parliamentary era lasted from 1920 to 1934 when in a coup d'etat, the father of Latvian independence, Carlis Ulmanis, uh, started a dictatorship and suspended parliament. In 1939, a pact between Nazi Germany and the Soviet Union saw Latvia incorporated into the Soviet Union, which took effect in 1940. A year later, Germany invaded and occupied Latvia in the Second World War. In 1944, Latvia was retaken by the Soviet Red Army and again became part of the Soviet Union. In 1949, 120,000 Latvians were imprisoned or sent to Siberian gulags, forced labour camps. Many more escaped to the West. There was a massive influx of Russians to Latvia to run its communist bureaucracy and work in the factories it created. In 1991, Latvia regained independence from the dissolving Soviet Union following people power activism that saw a 500 mile, 660 kilometer line consisting of 1.5 million people holding hands all the way from Vilnius, the capital of Lithuania, to Riga, Latvia, and onwards to the capital of Estonia, Tallinn, an unbroken line. The Latvian parliament, elected in 1993, fully reactivated the original constitution. Ethnic Latvians made up 75% of the population in 1935. This was reduced to 52% in 1989. Russian Special Forces, OMON, tried to retake power but failed. The Russian army only fully left in 1994. Many Russians stayed. They expected the same privileges that they had during the occupation. They didn't get that. Many refused to learn or speak Russian. With history repeating itself in Ukraine, Russian is less loudly heard in Latvia today. As you can appreciate, over its history, the territory of present-day Latvia has been occupied or settled on by people from many foreign countries. This has influenced present-day Latvia. The Occupation Museum tells recent history through the stories of Latvians, the characters in this real-life play, their names, their photos, a memento connected to them, the sword of a military officer, the bullet mark badge of a border post, the numbered clothing of a person who had been deported to a Siberian gulag, and above all, their stories. The border guards who are murdered by invading Russian soldiers, the political leaders, army chiefs and student activists who are murdered by the Cheka, the name by which the KGB was known in Latvia. Its headquarters were in a grand building on the corner of Brivibas and Stabu streets. It could have been an embassy. Instead, people were locked in cells and executed for not supporting Russia as the masters. There is a recreation of a Cheka cell in the museum that you can enter. Then you walk through a simulated forest where partisans lived in dugouts to fight the Russian army. You learn of the committed Latvian diplomats who represented Latvia from London during the Russian occupation. As a former diplomat myself, who has lived through a coup d'etat in Africa, I could appreciate the danger to themselves and their families. You next walk through a gulag in Siberia, a forced labour camp, where over 100,000 Latvians were sent to and lived in appalling conditions. You learn that private property and businesses were confiscated during the occupation without compensation. Farm owners became users. 
Soviet rubles replaced lats, with many people losing their savings. All cultural activities, including publications, were censored. The Russian language had to be used in public communications. Last of all, one experiences the protests, activism and Baltic unity that overcame the invaders in the early 1990s, just a few years before I first came to Latvia. A floor-to-ceiling video of the Baltic Way, the line of people holding hands, nearly had me in tears. I tell my public relations apprentices that a story that has tragedy, tension and triumph in it will be remembered, but will be the one that people will remember. The Occupation Museum had that in spades. Was there anything good that happened during the occupation, the Russian occupation? Let me tell you a story about a camera. Latvia maintained a well-developed infrastructure from before the Soviet-Russian occupation. It was decided in Moscow that some of the Soviet Union's most advanced manufacturing factories were to be based in Latvia. New industry was created in Latvia, including the only van and minibus factory in the Soviet Union, Riga Autobus Factory, which started in Riga but moved to Yelgova in the 1970s. Electrotechnical factories in Riga, chemical factories in Daugavpils, Valmira and Orlana, as well as food and oil processing plants. However, there was not enough people to operate these newly built factories. In order to expand industrial production, people from other Soviet republics were transferred to Latvia, noticeably decreasing the proportion of ethnic Latvians. New, tall housing blocks, built cheaply of prefabricated panels, were built around the suburbs of cities to house these workers. The Russians also de- donated one of its famous, or is that infamous, wedding cake buildings to Riga, so called as they resemble a tall wedding cake of many tiers, more technically known as Stalinist architecture. The one in Riga is 21 floors tall and was completed in 1961 after 10 years of construction. It is home to the Latvian Science Academy. But back to the camera. The Latvian company, Vals Electronikas Fabrika, VEF, was well known for the products it made. In 1930s, it began making the Minux camera. Latvian newspaper headlines on the 8th of April 1938 read, Sensation in the field of photography. Let's learn the interesting story about this camera. It was created by Walter Sapper, who was born in Riga on the 4th of September 1905 in a merchant's family. His father was a citizen of Great Britain and his mother was of German descent. In 1918, the Russians deported the family to the Ural Mountains. When they were allowed to return in 1921, the family settled in Tallinn, in Estonia. In 1922, Sapper began an apprenticeship at a photo studio in Tallinn. Here he developed his idea of a mini camera that would be convenient to carry around and easy to use. Sapper and a friend, Rihaz Jägens, formed a company in 1932, with Sapper providing ideas and Jürgens the financing. Unfortunately, Sapper was unable to interest any factory in making a mini camera. Finally, in 1936, Sapper and Jürgens met the director of VEF, Theodor Vitols, who was willing to take the risk and let the factory make the Minox camera. Sapper moved to Riga, signed a contract, and began working with Latvian engineers. The stainless steel, automatic Minox camera was small, micro at the time, at 80 by 27 by 17 millimetres, and weighing just 125 grams. Because of the Minox mini size, it was also used by many spies, 
In October of 1938, the very first Vef Minox was presented to the president of Latvia, Carlis Ormanis. The first Minox cameras were available for sale at the Vef shop on the corner of Brivibas and Rainer Boulevard in the centre of Riga. The Minox cost 248 lats. However, the Vef Minox claim to fame was short-lived as it was manufactured, manufactured for only four years, from 1938 to 1942. Until 1942, 17,000 cameras had been manufactured by VEF. When in 1940, Latvia was occupied by the Soviet Union, the engraving on the Minox camera, which had previously read Made in Latvia, was changed to Made in the USSR. VEF stopped manufacturing the Minox in 1942, and all of the items needed to manufacture the camera were sent to Germany. When World War II began, Sapper went to Berlin, and in 1945, he and Jürgens established the company Minox GmbH in Germany and began manufacturing the camera again. In 2000, Sapper, his son, and other representatives of the present Minox Camera Company visited the Latvian Museum of Photography, the Vefu Museum, and the office of the former director of VEF, Theodor Vitos, where Sapper had signed the contract with VEF. On the 24th of April 2001, the Academy of Sciences of Latvia honoured Sapper with an honorary doctor's degree. Sapper, the legendary inventor of the Minox camera, died in 2002 at the age of 97. Many of the large Soviet-era factories no longer operate. Riga Autobus factory went bankrupt in 1998. VEF was the largest factory in Soviet Latvia, but could not compete globally on technology and quality. It was broken up and mostly dissolved in 1999. Other relics of the Russian occupation have also been pulled down. A prominent statue of Lenin in Riga was pulled down in 1991. In February 2021, in the middle of the night in Yekopils, a Russian cannon monument from 1976 disappeared. The Russian embassy protested. Many Latvians applauded the action. It turned out the Gundas Kalvis, a Latvian farmer and businessman, pushed the cannon into the river Daugava with his tractor. It was never found. In 2022, Mr. Kalvis joined the Ukrainian army as a volunteer to fight the Russian invasion of Ukraine. The monument to the liberators of Soviet Latvia and Riga from the German fascist invaders, which is a bit of a mouthful, so simply known as the Victory Monument, was erected in 1985 in a park in Riga, built to commemorate the Red Army soldiers who captured Riga from Nazi German forces at the end of the Second World War, a 75-metre tall obelisk. The monument has been controversial in modern Latvian society, as many people regard it as a symbol of occupation, not of liberation. Some call it Moscow's middle finger. Following the Russian invasion of Ukraine in 2022, Riga City Council decided to pull down the monument. Demolition began on the 22nd of August, and on 25th of August, the middle finger was toppled. I passed the monument on a bus in August. There were barriers, taped off areas, road closures, and police everywhere. I thought I was passing a murder scene. My wife put me right when I got home. Now let's look at the German settlers and their manor houses and castles. In the 15th to 16th centuries, a hereditary landed class of Baltic nobility evolved from those German crusaders and religious leaders. In time, their descendants came to own vast estates over which they exercise absolute rights 
over the local population. At the end of the Middle Ages, this Baltic German minority had established themselves as the governing elite, partly as an urban trading population in the cities and partly as rural landowners via a network of manor house estates in Latvia. The titled landowners wielded economic and political power, and although they had a duty of care for the peasants dependent on them, in practice the peasants were forced into serfdom. While there are records of Latvian last names going as far back as the 15th century, almost all of them were inhabitants of large cities and often adopted Germanic family names. Some peasants had their family names in the 17th century, but the majority had only first names until the emancipation. Most people were identified by the name of their house or manor. Emancipation in 1826 created the need for identity papers and with this for family names. Livonian peasants had to choose family names. Peasants were prohibited from choosing family names of German nobility and the majority chose names related to animals, plants and trees. Especially popular were diminutive forms, so Berge, Birch, Berzinch, small birch, or Kalns, hill, Kalnins, small hill. There are over 1,000 manor houses in Latvia. I'm going to tell the story of two that I have a particular affection for. One is big and well known, the other much less so. Rundala Palace lies to the south of Latvia near the town of Bauschke. In 1735, the German Duke of Courland, Ernst Johann von Bieren, bought land in Rundala, demolished an existing medieval castle and started construction of a new summer palace. This was a large Baroque-style building with a formal garden consisting of a French garden, a rose garden and a park. The building stood unfinished and empty until 1762 and construction was only finished in 1768. However, von Buren loved the palace and spent summers there until his death in 1772. After Latvia was absorbed by the Russian Empire in 1795, Catherine the Great presented the palace to Count Valerian Zubov the youngest brother of her lover, Prince Platon Zubov. He spent his declining years there until his death. His young widow, Thekla Valentinovich, a local landowner's daughter, married Count Shuvalov, and the palace remained in the Shuvalov family until 1920. However, the Shuvalovs rarely stayed there. During the French invasion of Russia, In 1812, the palace was used as a hospital for Napoleon's army and the interior was destroyed. History repeats itself as during the German occupation in the First World War, the German army established a hospital there. The palace suffered serious damage in 1919 during the Latvian War of Independence when it was partially burned. In 1933, Rundala Palace was taken over by the Ministry of Education and was officially reconstructed for use as a school. A grain storehouse was set up in the premises in addition to the school. Later, the Duke's dining room was transformed into the school's gymnasium. A school was located in the palace until 1978. The Supreme Soviet of Latvian SSSR, decided to restore Rundala Palace. In 1972, Rundala Palace Museum was established. The Latvian painter and art historian Imants Lansmanis became director of the new museum and restoration of the palace became his life's work. Extensive research 
and restoration work was completely funded by the state until 1992. After the restoration of Latvia's independence, the state continued to finance restoration work in part, with additional finance, financing through private donations, and later also from the EU. In the spring of 2015, it was announced that restoration work in the palace and its formal gardens was complete. The state rooms, the Gold Hall and White Hall, were restored to their former glory, together with the Duke and Duchess's chambers. The palace is now a major tourist destination. My personal touch points with this palace span nearly 20 years. In 1999, I was acting British ambassador and represented Great Britain at the inauguration of the new president, Dr. Vyra Vika Freiberger. The reception immediately after the inauguration in Parliament was attended by leading politicians, business people, the then mayor of Ventspils and oligarch Ivers Lembergs and his family were immediately behind me in the queue to congratulate the new president. Cultural icons, sports people and foreign ambassadors. The, the magnificent, magnificent colour-themed rooms of Rundana made a grand setting for the reception with the invited guests in formal evening dress. Then, in 2016, I got married there, in the same beautiful white hall in which I had congratulated the president many years before. We had a classical music ensemble, including a harpist, a relative on my wife's side, to play music at the ceremony. Dundaka Castle is a medieval castle in the region of Kurzme, to the northwest in Latvia. It has an inner courtyard, a gate tower, and walls two to three metres thick. Adjoining the castle is a 21 hectare park with 48 species of trees. The German Archbishop Bishopric of Riga gained control over the lands of Dundaga in 1237. It is assumed that the fortified castle was constructed in the late 13th century and was captured several times by the Teutonic Knights. In 1434, the castle was sold to the Bishopric of Courland and sold again in 1559, this time to the King of Denmark, who in turn granted it to his brother Magnus, Duke of Holstein, a future, a future bishop. Some significant real estate sales going on there. In the middle of the 17th century, it was transformed from a medieval fortress to a representative residence of a country nobleman. It is surrounded by water on three sides and originally had a mo moat on the fourth side. Dundaga Castle suffered heavily in a fire in 1872 and its historical interiors were destroyed. It burned again in 1905 and was renovated, modernised and transformed in 1909. The family of Austin Sacken were owners of the castle up until 1920. Since 1926, the castle has been used as a public building by the local authority for administration purposes as Dundega's secondary school from 1926 to 1974 and as a cultural institution. The castle is the source of numerous legends, tales and ghost stories which in many cases are close to real historical events. As legend has it, when a, um, a dwarf king was celebrating his wedding at Dundaga Castle, the baron's sister unintentionally interrupted the festivity, and for this she was walled in while alive. She is the so-called green maiden, Jumprava, whose ghost still haunts the castle. A few of the grand rooms have been turned into accommodation. When we stayed theirs, there, ours was a lovely room overlooking the park with a big four-poster bed. We didn't expect the additional guest. During the middle of the night, 
my wife was tapped on the shoulder by a young lady, a ghost. Yes, the green maiden paid us a visit. Arvid's Blumenthal's, reportedly christened as a baron in the castle, if you believe the first of his many tales, was born in Dundaga in 1925. In 1942, he joined the Nazi Latvian forces on the Eastern Front, sustained serious injuries and was captured by American troops. After the war, Arvids emigrated to Australia and took up an occupation that was perhaps even more dangerous, hunting crocodiles. Having arrived in Australia in 1951, he began poaching cro crocodiles in 1956, recording his early expeditions in the books Latvian Crocodile Hunter in Australia and Long After the Sun. Legend has it that Harry, as he changed his name to, killed as many as 40,000 crocodiles to sell the flesh for cash over his two-decade career before giving up the poaching game to retire to an underground cave in central Australia. Latvians who admire their countryman will proudly tell you that Arvids Blumenthal's provided the inspiration for Paul Hogan's iconic Mick Dundee character and the enormously successful Crocodile Dundee film franchise in the 1980s. Australians who have done their research instead point to Rod Ansell, a croc poacher who, was, who made global headlines in 1977 after surviving the remote Northern Territory bush with almost no supplies for 56 days. But let's not let the truth get in the way of Crocodile Harry's claim to fame. Harry died in 2006, aged 80, his spirit lives on in two ways. A crocodile statue in Dundaga and his underground home in Kuba Pedi, which is now a museum to one of the Outback's more colourful characters. Latvia is rich in manor houses and castles in all of the four regions of the country. Many of these were used as schools during the Soviet Russian occupation. Some still are, but many are now open to the public, restored and operating thanks to local donors, volunteers and EU grants. Well worth a visit to Latvia just to see and experience this aspect of history. A final thought. History has a habit of repeating itself. Walking around the Occupation Museum, I couldn't but help think about Russia's present aggression, invading Ukraine, in an attempt to take over that country, its people and their freedoms. A different dictator, Putin, not Stalin, but the same goal, the complete domination of another country. I understood why Latvia, a small country, wanted to do so much for Ukraine, a big country, today. Knuts Skyaniks, a poet who was arrested in 1962, sent to a gulag who was only allowed to publish his poems after Latvia regained independence, wrote, Do not shed your tears for yesterday. Do not fear what comes tomorrow. Just in a steadfast, measured way, plough your furrow, straight and narrow. <laughs>